Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll call the Missoula City Council meeting of February 26, 2018 to order. If you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please let the record note that we have a whole seven council members here this evening. Missing are Ms. Becerra, Mr. Ramos, Mr. Dabari, and Ms. Merritt. We have minutes of the meeting of February 12th. Without objection, they'll be approved. Seeing none. I thought I noted that. Mr. Ramos absent, yeah. And Mr. Dabari? Okay. Shall I repeat them? Okay. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to our schedule of committee meetings. Ms. Rayvine. Thanks, Maringen. Um, grab the right sheet of paper here. Uh, Public Safety and Health is meeting this Wednesday, the 28th of February. Uh, at 9 a.m. till 9.55. Land and planning goes from 10 a.m. till 11, same day. Uh, Public Works follows that from 11.05 in the morning in, until 12.15 uh, in the afternoon. Parks and Conservation will meet from 12.20 to 12.40. Administration and Finance Committee will meet from 1.15 to 2.25. Budget Committee of the Whole will round out the day from 2.30 to 3.15. And all those meetings are being held right here in the City Council Chambers at 140 West Pine Thank Street. Thank you, Ms. Any changes to the committee schedule? Seeing none of those, we'll move on to the general public comment portion of our agenda. Is your opportunity to comment on items not elsewhere on the agenda this evening. Mr. Grimm. Uh, Doug Grimm. Um, I'm from the Upper Rattlesnake. You know, when we get old, we start thinking about our arteries. And I also think about some other arteries, some of which I want you to think about also because they're important to me and they're things that you sort of govern. I'm talking about when I come out of the rattlesnake, I uh, turn on spruce, one of the major arteries that I just love, and I head toward Higgins, and there's nice wide bicycle lanes on each side. I have a nice wide traffic lane heading east, and another one heading west. And in the wintertime, you can run a snow plow down there and you can put a berm in the middle of the street that's this wide and, and that tall and not interfere with the joy of me traveling down into uh, <coughs> the center of of the old part of town. And Higgins Avenue is the same way. Broadway is the same way. What I would like you to think about now is the artery, a major artery here in Missoula, called Front Street. Now originally, that was just an old Indian trail along the river. And the Indians had street signs. They would probably would have put uh, trail to the buffalo on it. 1852, uh, white men showed up. And they enlarged it and made it many, many miles long from Fort Benton to Walla Walla. And uh, they call it the Mullen Trail or Military Trail. And now, uh, if you are at uh, Higgins and front and you go walk or drive east, the street that you're on from the bank building to, the, say, the front the building of the, what was the Missoula Mercantile, that street, I think, is about 90 feet wide. And you continue heading east for two blocks, it continues about that width, and then it narrows down to about 80 feet. Now that particular block where it narrows down is where you are planning and building a new public library. And I was kind of thinking, you know, over the years when there was no construction going on in that uh, block, uh, and for, for several blocks there, I always felt a little bit constrained when I got halfway to the Madison Street Bridge. It seemed like the cars were parked on each side of me, and it seemed like I, I had to really concentrate on not hitting those cars and not hitting the car that was traveling along with me, because it's a two-lane street. And I was thinking, boy, it would be really great if, while you were working on this library building, if you could take, say, 10 feet off of the north side of Front Street, property that you're going to build the new library on and dedicate that 
to public right of way. So you, you would be able to have a same width street all the way to <coughs> Madison. Now, you're, <coughs> if you are there at the new library, where you're going to build the new library, and if you look east, you can see the ramp for the Madison Street Bridge is just one block away. And that is the original section of the town. All those buildings there were built by the original settlers. Now we've torn a whole block down. And over the years that I've lived here, I've seen house after house come down in sections and being rebuilt. And I have a feeling that it's not going to be too many years until from the new library building to Madison Street, they'll all be coming down. And maybe at that time, you could make the street another 10 feet wider by asking those people to donate some money, some, some land on each side, and make that a nice wide street all the way to the Madison Street Bridge. Also, there's another real thing that uh, constricts traffic, and that is when we laid out the streets in Missoula, we had named them after the president. There's Washington Street on the uh, west side of the old library, and the next president was Adams. That's going to be between the new li two libraries. And then on the other side, on the east side of the new library, is the third president, Jefferson. Jefferson is a two-way street, and if you try and, and drive on Jefferson and there's cars parked next to the curb on each side, there's only room for one car to go on that street. So you start up the street or you start down the street, and if someone starts coming towards you, you have to pull off into a parking spot or into a driveway or back up because you can only get one car through. And I thought, boy, it would really be great if you would take maybe 10 or 12 feet off the land where you're going to build the new library and make that street not only two lanes for parking, one in each direction, <coughs> but a two-lane street where two cars can pass safely. Enough for my arteries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Any other general public comment this evening? Ms. Holm? I'm Jan, <clears throat> Jan Holm, also from up in the Rattlesnake. And I'm here to talk about an event that's going to be happening um, several times in this area in the coming month. I'm a member of Montana Elders for a Livable Tomorrow, and we are exactly what our name, name stands for. Um, because of the wildfires that we all experienced last year, I think they're still pretty prominent in our thinking about the coming summer. One of the reasons we're holding these events now is so that you have time to get your home ready, especially if, if you live in the Wui, if you live close to forest. Embers in a wildfire can travel a mile or more, and if they settle on a cluster of leaves close to wood, they can smolder and get a fire going. So what we're going to try to do is educate as many people as we can. Jack Cohen, a scientist who's worked at the Missoula Fire Lab for two decades and studied fire, wildfire behavior, and structures that survive and structures that don't survive a wildfire will be speaking. Um, I'll, and besides learning about what you can do for your home, we'll cover a lot of extras, such as getting a free assessment for your home and its needs, reverse 911, which was really important in the last summer in helping people who were in a critical area, insurance, what you need to do ahead of time, and the questions that you need to ask your insurance agents, and financial work and work assistance for you, and really encouraging people to work together in neighborhoods because if your neighbor's house is safe, yours is much safer. So working together is important. The first event is a week from Wednesday on March 7th at the UC Theater at 5 o'clock. That's for Molly members and their guests. The second one is in Bonner on uh, the 11th. That's at 1 in the afternoon. That's a Sunday. The third one is at Grant Creek on the 21st. That's at 7 o'clock at night. And that's for the general public. And we've been contacted by other groups, one in Stevensville, uh, Georgetown Lake, O'Brien Creek, Patty Canyon. Uh, this is really catching on, so it's something you want to attend. And we'll try to keep it in front of you. This is the poster. It's a rough draft. I just drove down so I could pick up the others. But I, I'll pass it around for you. The good thing about the poster is it shows the fire approaching. 
It shows the house engulfed by smoke. You don't see the flames. And then you see the burning in front of the house when the fire is passed down on and the fire is still there. If you're in an area that experiences a wildfire, may that be the story of your home. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Mr. McMillan. Mark McMillan, Ward 6. Uh, it's been a while. Contrary to what you guys might think, I'm actually here mostly for comments and or compliment, a big one and to tell you a short story. First, a little history. Unfortunately, on November 21 last year, one of Missoula's less than upstanding citizens decided to go on a package stealing spree in my neighborhood. They essentially started by stealing a package from just a few doors down from where they themselves live. From there, they decided to steal packages from at least three, other, three more homes that day in the area between 7th, 10th, Russell, and Reserve, finishing with stealing a box containing $300 worth of goods from my porch. In the past, this person has had two DWIs in a month and has been arrested for other less potentially deadly crimes. And not surprising, they were using someone else's car during their porch pirating spree through the neighborhood. He's also one of two things, very evil or very stupid. Get a load of this. As he went along stealing packages, he would leave the emptied package from the previous theft on the porch in place of the new one full of other people's property. With what I found on my porch and one phone call, I was able to trace the three other thefts that day besides mine before even calling the police. The new folks on this council probably don't know what I do for a living. I'm a locksmith, safe technician, and yes, on rare occasion, I do some electronic security. So three of the many eyes I have on my property got some decent video of the car and the thief. One of the most disturbing things is how nonchalant this guy was in committing his crime. I only have three minutes, so let's get to the compliments part. As unfortunate as this whole situation was, let me say something great came out of it. One of the other victims who came to my house to meet with the police and I had the great fortune to meet Officer Pat Mulligan of the, pre, uh, of the Missoula Police Department, badge number 335. In recent years on the news and in the internet, law enforcement has been measurably taunted, provoked, disrespected, and criticized, casting a dark shadow on all those in uniform because of the actions of a few. I work with some really great deputies from the Sheriff's Department on a regular basis doing evictions, but that's an entirely different situation. Officer Mulligan was a wake-up call back to what I know to be the real image I have of the law enforcement officer. He was professional, courteous, friendly, patient, thorough, attentive, and actually genuinely cared, and you could tell. Everything you want from our city police department. Even better, he found the thief in the car the next night and called me to let me know the car was impounded. Full of packages, way more than mine, and the person was wearing the same clothes. Um, but with it being the night before Thanksgiving, nothing would really be able to be done until the next week. But I appreciated that knowledge. On January 19th, I emailed Officer Mulligan's supervisor, Sergeant Stevenson, to let him know how great it was to work with Officer Mulligan and what avenue I could pursue to make some kind of official compliment and asked to bring it up at council was appropriate. There's a lot more to this story, and it's still not over. The suspect has pled, uh, pled not guilty. And last I know is scheduled to appear in court for initial omnibus hearings um, March 13th at 2 p.m. But get ready. Chapter 2 of the Porch Pirates of Missoula just started being written a little over a week ago on February 16th. That day a car with two people in it decided to steal two packages left on my porch by the Postal Service. This time it was about $80 worth of goods, but as you may have guessed, I specifically waited until Officer Mulligan was on shift to have him write up the report. Once again, I had the pleasure of working with one of Missoula's finest, and I hope, they find, I hope they find these guys too. Going back to Sergeant Stevenson's response, he suggested that I draft a letter ad addressed directly to Mayor Engen, as that letter would be seen by Police Chief Mike Brady, and would be an official form of com uh, commendation for Officer Mulligan. Um, thank you for what I'm sure has been a little bit extra time here. If my ward reps or anyone else on council wants to know more about the thefts, please feel free to talk with me after the meeting or give me a call. As ward reps, I think you'd be interested in knowing what I've learned from this experience, how our local system is handling these types of crimes, and why you should be concerned. I'm not too hard to find. If it's all right, I'd like to personally hand that letter to Mayor Engen now, if that's acceptable, and I have another copy for the recorder. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Any other general public comment this evening? Ms. Matthew Jenkins. <coughs> Candy Matthew Jenkins, 1211 Cooper Street. 
I've been absent, I've been sick, and I want to say hello to all the new members, as I guess only a few I see. <laughs> but um, second, I want to catch up a little bit because I haven't been attending in so long. On the topic of the shortfall, I think it was called a rainy day fund. The council was made knowledgeable of that um, when John Kappas's dad testified to that in late 2016, early 2017. The, I think he found that there was 1.3 million less in that fund. And actually, uh, to remember the 25,000 mil, 20, five million dollar error too. And a comment about the mall, <laughs> what can I say? Who would have thunk they would use taxpayers dollars to line their pockets with an out of state company in Ohio to sell to? Third, I'm going to resume reading the Soviet art of brainwashing, uh, psychopolitics, the mental, the art, the art of mental healing, uh, which is ever more important than ever before, looking at what has befallen our nation for a long time now. Fourth, I'm a copy, I'm a, I've been a coffee in the morning reader of the Missoulian. A couple years ago, I realized there were no notices about city council meetings in the paper and I looked into why that was and contacted a friend that did research and uh, brought it to uh, the attention of the council citing a Supreme Court's decision from 1938, public notification of public meetings being printed for public view. The upshot of that was the Missoulian uh, began pr printing city council meetings again, and the Missoulian got a $35,000 contract. Now I am sorry to say I'm giving up the Missoulian. We say we are a caring community, but what I have seen portrayed in our hometown paper is unfettered vehement vitriol and an animosity for anyone who doesn't think as a vocal minority thinks. And this kind of proves my point. In the paper from the 10th of February, okay with the party of President Satan, and then opposite as that is an article about love. So I think I'm done with it. There's nothing in there worth reading anymore, and I'll have to go to my Bible more in the mornings. Any other general public comment this evening? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Items on that agenda were approved unanimously in city council committees. We save a little time on Monday evenings by considering these items all at once. Ms. Rabine will read the list of consent agenda items aloud so those in the audience and those at home will know what we're considering and we'll invite comment on these items before we vote. Ms. Rabine. Thanks, Mayor Ingen. Tonight's consent agenda has six items. First, as always, are the city's accounts payable, which we refer to them as claims. Uh, number one is to ratify claims in the amount of $1,147,731.89 for checks that were dated February 20th, 2018. We didn't meet last week, so we have to ratify the bills that were paid last week. Number two is to approve claims in the amount of $572,000. $156.24 for checks that are dated tomorrow, January 27th, 2018. Number three, although a quorum wasn't present in committee, um, we're recommending to set a public hearing on March 12th, 2018 on a resolution to support revisions to rule number 4.112 
of the Missoula City County Air Pollution Control Program regarding wildfire smoke episodes. Number four is to adopt a resolution of the City Council declaring a city, certain City of Missoula small, irregularly shaped parcel of land totaling approximately 2,400 square feet, generally located at the northern terminus of West Franklin Street, south and west of the intersection of South 6th Street West and Ivy Street, a surplus, and authorizing its disposal and sale to Black Walnut LLC in the amount of $10,380 and a two-thirds vote of all council members, that's eight members, is required for adoption. Number five, although a quorum isn't present, uh, the committee uh, made a motion, uh, but it was listed incorrectly on the agenda. So I'll read the motion made by committee and then uh, the corrected motion. Uh, the motion made by the committee was to approve Dick Anderson construction as a construction manager at risk for the MRL or Montana Rail Link Park project that's located in Urban Renewal District 3 an amount not to exceed $6,500. Uh, the corrected motion, uh, the council's action this evening is to actually, um, is being asked to approve Dick Anderson as the construction manager at risk. Um, that's a requirement of state law. So the correct motion is to approve Dick Anderson construction as a construction manager at risk, affectionately known as the CMAR, for a Montana Rail Link Park project located in Urban Renewal District 3, pursuant to uh, 18-2-503 sub 4 of Montana Code Annotated, also known as the state law. And finally, number six is to approve and authorize the mayor to sign the Territorial Land Works Incorporated Professional Engineering Services Agreement for a Brooks Stevens Mount Area Maintenance Phase 2 project in an amount not to exceed $36,338. Thank you, Ms. Rabine. Any questions from council or discussion on consent agenda? Ms. Ron Osberg. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to inquire about the recommended course of action for item four. If I understood Marty correctly, we need um, two thirds of all council members. Since, since we don't have that, could we hold that over, or what would the procedure be to? Mr. Nugent? It does require two thirds of the entire council. Okay, so we'll hold that item. Thank you. Okay. Anything further? Anyone in the audience care to comment on any items on the consent agenda this evening? Seeing none, we will have a roll call vote on items one through three and five and six. Okay, on the consent agenda, less uh, item number four. Anderson. Yes. Anderson votes yes. Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Harp. Yes. Harp votes yes. Hess. Hess votes yes. Von Losberg. Von Losberg votes yes. And West. West votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That is seven eyes and five na and five absent. And the consent agenda is approved. We'll move on to comments from city staff, uh, agencies, boards, commissions, authorities. And the community forum, we have four uh, neighborhood council reports this evening, and we'll begin with River Road. Good evening. My name is Melissa Neidig, and I am from the River Road. I'm here to report on our general meeting, which was held on February 13th. Uh, we had Ethan Smith from the Malo Missoula Police Department come and tell us about the new storage facility that's going in the neighborhood. Um, we also had Bill Pfeiffer come from the Mountain Line um, and just tell us kind of what they're doing this year and anything new that's coming along. Um, we had Courtney Sprunger from the Big Sky Public Relations come and talk about the Russell Street project and all of the ways that the neighbors can get information on the construction and the timeline and any detours and all of that. Um, everyone is very excited and we still don't believe that it's actually gonna happen. So we're all looking forward to that starting. Um, we also held elections um, for our leadership team. And then we also had a question and answer uh, with Councilwoman Julie Merritt. Um, some of the concerns that came up um, from the neighbors um, included street connectivity in the neighborhood. 
Um, the lack of curbs, gutters, sidewalks, and lights on the major roads that are in our neighborhood. And um, with Invest Health um, doing their project and then being able to find some funding for the other neighborhoods that were in that project, but not ours. Um, there were just some questions as to what the next steps were gonna be on that. Um, we also held our meeting at Garden City Harvest in their new location on River Road. Um, so we were one of the first kind of groups that they had there. Um, so it's a really nice space if you haven't checked it out yet. Um, and then they're looking forward to once it's nicer, having more neighbors involved and just kind of gathering and having a nice place to hang out in and just enjoy all their fabulous plants and orchards. Thank you, ma'am. And Mr. Hoffman from the Upper Rattlesnake. Hello, Hans Hoffman with the Upper Rattlesnake. We had our meeting on February 11th. We received a report from Meg Wicker of uh, Parks and Rec regarding considering a bike skills park. Uh, we're all looking forward to that being installed. Uh, it was expressed at the meeting from the public a desire for additional parking. Uh, a crosswalk from the soccer fields to the bike park and sidewalks or bike trail connecting that park with uh, the rest of town. Uh, we got a report from Melt and uh, I don't need to go over that because that was already uh, part of public comment here that was uh, regarding fire safety in the rattlesnake. A uh, report from Nick Holloway regarding Smart 911, uh, where he explained the advantages of Smart 911, how to uh, customize your safety profile and how to sign up. We received a report from Shane Stack of MDOT regarding the Van Buren Roundabouts project where he laid out the, uh, the time frame for the work that is to commence this summer. Uh, initial work will start in March with uh, removal of some trees and then the main work will start in April and proceed through the whole summer. We received a report from Monty Seip of City Engineering regarding the Van Buren Phase 3 a uh, construction project that will uh, create a left turn lane onto uh, Missoula Avenue off of uh, Van Buren, as well as add gutters and sidewalks uh, up through that part of Van Buren. We received a report from Paul Parsons of Trout Unlimited regarding the removal of the Rattlesnake Dam. Um, apparently the concern is that it blocks migrating fish. River Design Group of uh, Morrison Merrill Engineering is collecting data now, and there's going to be a meeting somewhere around March 20th, though it has not been fully set, to look at options. Uh, we received a report regarding uh, the bear buffer zone and Republic Services trash collection issue. Um, we've established a working group wherein we're, we're looking at uh, ways to uh, mitigate the problems. Uh, currently, trash can be picked up at 5 a.m., uh, but in a bear buffer zone, you are not allowed to put out your trash before 5 a.m. And most people are not up that early. Um, there's there been talk about a later pickup time and also uh, lowering the cost of bear proof cans. Um, in uh, in a Q&A with city council people, we, uh, we discussed many things, including urban deer and traffic signals at the bottom of uh, Van Buren and Broadway. Uh, in the leadership team elections, Doug Grimm, Bev Young, Bree Ender, and Bill Ruder were all reelected. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And from Franklin to the Fort, Mr. Lomas. Hi, good evening. I'm Matt Loomis with the Franklin to the Fort Neighborhood Council. Uh, we were late to the party with general meetings. We had ours on February 20th? 20th. We kept it light. We decided to keep it positive to, to uh, get the people there thinking positive and kind of a gross snowy night. Um, we talked about some recent brag successes. Um, Missoula's Invest Health Assessment has led to some new sidewalks in our neighborhood. Not a ton, but with the help of CDBG funds, we're able to fill some gaps specifically connecting to Franklin School and Franklin Park, help keep our neighborhood a little more active. Um, something we had absolutely nothing to do with, but we got to meet in our brand new Franklin School. So for those that did vote for that, thank you very much, our neighborhood needs it. We got uh, to talk about a new park in the southeast area of our neighborhood, MRL Park. Uh, thanks to the city and the MRA, that's coming, we're just gonna say soon. Um, 
we've had a pretty good turnout for the last few meetings, um, whether it was the Mary Avenue Connection, Franklin Park, Franklin School, a summer general meeting. We've had a lot more engagement in such a big um, kind of disjointed neighborhood. We talked about we even have some new art on traffic control boxes. Things that we're looking to do up ahead and things that we'd like to work with the city and with council on, working with the police department on a neighborhood watch program with uh, Officer Smith. Um, just like we've heard a couple times tonight, we've had some major um, crime and safety concerns in our neighborhood. Um, staying ahead of development in our neighborhood. We currently have a rezoning application and a conditional use application in our neighborhood. Um, I'm not here to comment on those, but it's just that we want to stay on top of those so that we can make sure that the infill and redevelopment in our neighborhood is what's best for our neighborhood. And we're going to continue to ask City Council for help with sidewalks in our neighborhood. For those that aren't aware, uh, Franklin to the Fort is the most populated neighborhood in Missoula and the least sidewalked neighborhood. Um, and until we get our new park, we are also the least parked neighborhood. So we really could use some help getting around there. Curbs and gutters and uh, uh, storm drains would really help also, um, as would lighting. Continued work with Invest Health group, group and the City Council will hopefully help bridge some gaps literally and figuratively thank you very much thank you sir and our community forum report this evening comes from mr walton i'm jack walton miller creek neighborhood council and i'm here to brief the city council on the community forum mr mayor city council and members of the public uh as we went through, we had uh, a quorum. We had 15 of the 18 neighborhoods represented. And uh, for presentations, we had uh, neighborhood fire wise preparation, wildfire ready or not by uh, Joe Toth, uh, Montana elder for the livable tomorrow. He made a presentation. I, we got a flyer just like what went around and they talked about the public meetings that were coming up. Then uh, Tom, Zavik, uh, City of Missoula, talked about the university district neighborhood character, and that had to do with uh, zoning and uh, buildings and the envelope of uh, buildings on lots and stuff in the university district. And then uh, also Tom kicked off the Brook Street corridor. Uh, Vince uh, Caristo from Mountain Line was there, and. Uh, Aaron Wilson of uh, Missoula Transportation Planning talked about uh, a few of the items and things that they're dealing with uh, with uh, uh, Brook Street Corridor, talked about right-of-ways and uh, things like that and, and about Mountain Line, how they uh, looking at uh, changing some uh, distances and things like that where they have bus stops and things like that. Uh, we had uh, reallocation of uh, some funds for uh, Missoula Urban uh, uh, District uh, Glass Permeable Pathway. Uh, that's using recycled glass, ground up grass. And then uh, we had uh, talked about, and Jane will be making a presentation, Jane Kelly will be making a presentation to the council about the neighborhood uh, volunteer of the year and uh, we had a, a group award too so she'll be discussing that uh, in the near future and then uh, from the neighborhood councils upper rattlesnake and lower rattlesnake uh, talked about uh, smart 911 and but also they talked about the roundabouts and, and van buren street and those type of things and there's some concerns by a few of the citizens and things like that uh, Riverfront had uh, uh, traffic calming. They looked at some of those things that was uh, uh, between Wyoming and California Street and some of those things. And then uh, the University District, they uh, concerned about speeding on uh, Maurice up to Beckwith and uh, they're looking at uh, contacting the police department about uh, some uh, enforcement on that. And uh, Lewis and Clark also uh, had uh, some discussions about uh, traffic calming. And uh, River Road, they had uh, discussions about the Russell Street project. And so 
And then uh, Loose Can Gully, they uh, appreciated the sanding that was going on up on uh, uh, the streets up there. And they talked about a little bit of congestion on uh, 55th Street. Mr. Mayor, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walt. We will move on to special presentations. We have one this evening in the form of a proclamation. Whereas <clears throat> the Meals on Wheels program at Missoula Aging Services is a valuable resource to older adults in Missoula County. And whereas more than 800 homebound elders and adults with disabilities received Meals on Wheels in the past year, with more than 101,300 meals served in Missoula County, and whereas volunteer drivers for Meals on Wheels are the backbone of this program, through their dedication to bring not only hot, nutritious meals to clients, but also caring, concern, and attention to their well, well, pardon me, and attention to their welfare. And whereas Missoula Aging Services counts on these volunteers and the support of the community to serve the growing numbers of elders who need this service in order to remain in their homes. And whereas we wish to raise awareness and support for Meals on Wheels in Missoula and surrounding areas. Now, therefore, we, the Missoula County Board of Commissioners and the Mayor of the City of Missoula do hereby proclaim the month of March 2018 as March for Meals Month in Missoula, Montana and invite citizens to thank the caring volunteer drivers, recognize the value of this service to homebound elders and adults with disabilities, and encourage citizens to volunteer as Meals on Wheels drivers so elders may remain in their homes. Document signed by me, as well as Commissioners Strohmeyer, Curtis, and Rowley. We will now move on to the public hearing portion of our agenda. State law and our own council rule set guideline for inviting comment in a formal way on a variety of issues. Following a staff report on each of these, council and I will invite comment. Uh, council typically votes uh, <clears throat> on the same night as the public hearing, unless one council member elects to return that item to committee for further consideration. And we'll take these hearings in order, beginning with uh, budget amendments for the Missoula Redevelopment Agency for fiscal year 2000. 17 and Ms. Dunn has our staff report this evening. Hi everybody. I'm Jill Dunn from the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and I'm here to provide the staff report on our request for City Council approval of Missoula Redevelopment Agency's FY17 budget amendments. Um, every year during our budget process the MRA submits our conservative numbers for the following year because our taxable <coughs> values don't come in until July and then the final mill levies are set for our urban renewal districts those tax and jurisdictions mill levies are set in October. So we use conservative numbers. And so during our annual audit process that we just concluded, um, we always do this administrative follow-up by bringing to you the changes in those taxable values and any of the additional bonding that we've done through the year. The bonds require city council approval when they are done. So those bonds have already been through the city council process. And then of course, any of the expenditures that are done through the agency are approved according to um, the MRA bylaws through our five member board. So uh, this was presented to city council to you in administration and finance committee. And we are asking for your approval of a resolution that amends the Missoula Redevelopment Agency FY17 budget to increase revenues by $3,044,303 and increasing expenditures by $1,925,713 in order to recognize those additional revenues and expenditures that occurred during the year. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Dunn. With that, I will open the public hearing. Does anyone care to comment on these budget amendments? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions from council members? Seeing none, Ms. Harp. I move that we adopt a resolution amending the annual appropriations for the city of Missoula, Montana, as set forth in the fiscal year 2017 budget that amends the total Missoula Redevelopment Agency, or MRA, their budget including increasing revenues by $3,044,303 and increasing expenditures by $1,925,713. In order to recognize the additional revenue based on final valuations and mill levies, anticipated bond proceeds, administrative and project related revenue and expenditures during the fiscal year and incorporate ongoing construction projects and bond issues with related debt service that were carried forward from fiscal year 2016. 
That motion is in order. Is there a discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we've had a public hearing. We'll have a roll call vote. On the resolution for the MRA budget amendment, uh, Armstrong. Yes. Armstrong votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Harp. Yes. Harp votes yes. Hess. Hess votes yes. Von Lossberg. Von Lossberg votes yes. West. Yes. West votes yes. Anderson. Yes. Anderson votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That is seven ayes and five absent. And the motion is approved. We'll move on to our second public hearing this evening on a resolution amending the fiscal year 2018 budget to recognize additional appropriations for reimbursed fire overtime, cemetery fees, and the community development block grant sidewalk project. And without objection, we'll combine the staff report and the public hearings on uh, a further resolution amending the fiscal year 2018 budget to increase appropriations and add an administrative assistant to position for uh, Garden City Compost. And our staff report this evening comes from Ms. Griffin. Hi, thank you um, for letting me combine these two public hearings. Uh, we have four items that we're asking City Council to amend the budget for. None of these actually require an increase in revenues. They have associated revenues coming with them. There are additional staff here in the audience in case City Council has specific questions for the various departments. We'd like to uh, amend the budget um, for the fire department requesting an increase uh, to the reimbursed overtime budget. Also for the cemetery department requesting an increase to, excuse me, <clears throat> for their operating supplies to cover the increase in expenditures related to recently approved services and fees related to burial services and monument setting. And for development services engineering requesting approval to expend resources related to the Invest Health sidewalk project. This was a project scheduled to begin in FY19. However, due to the grant being awarded, this project was accelerated. A CDBG grant was awarded to the city this past fall, and per the contract, this project is supposed to be completed by the end of the first quarter of the federal fiscal year this coming September. This, that project is being funded by a CDBG grant and road district number one. And the last um, item to amend the budget is to add an additional administrative assistant to due to the increased workload from creating the compost facility. It's exceeding their current staffing levels. Um, and this item is also going to, it's is revenue neutral due to the revenues coming into the compost facility. But in bringing this as an FY18 budget amendment, it will be on the FY, part of the FY19 baseline for the wastewater utility budget. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Ms. Griffin. With that, I will open the public hearing on these budget amendments. Anyone care to comment? <coughs> and I apologize. I have a dose of whatever is going around that doesn't seem to want to leave. <coughs> All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Are there any questions from council? Seeing none, Ms. Harp. I move that we adopt a resolution amending the annual appropriations for the City of Missoula, Montana as set forth in the fiscal year 2018 budget that increases the total city budget by $794,165 in order to appropriate, appropriate expenditures related to reimburse fire overtime, cemetery <coughs> operating expenses, and community development block grant or CDBG sidewalk project. Thank you. And we, is there a discussion on that motion? Ms. Karras. I will be voting in support of the motion. I wanted to comment, though, because during committee, when we approved the setting of this public hearing, there was, um, we had a discussion about how this public hearing should look and whether or not these pieces for the general, uh, for the fire department, cemetery, and development service should be split out or taken as a whole. Um, one of the council members who isn't here felt strongly that the piece for the cemetery should be taken out because that um, the cemetery's change in operations was not voted on unanimously by council and um, they felt that the any subsequent votes on the matter should be under a higher level of scrutiny I think is what they felt and I um, wasn't sure how I would feel about it and didn't know how I would vote but um, in voting in support today because in the end that 
um, change in operations was approved by City Council and therefore it makes sense to um, write our budget in line with those changes. So thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Von Losberg. Thanks. Um, I support the amendments and I think it's just worth highlighting and I appreciate Ms. Griffin pointing out that these are revenue neutral um, adjustments. Um, good examples with fire for instance where they've collected significant revenue via um, firefighting in other jurisdictions and such um, and I again just think it's important to underscore that these are not changes in expenditures without uh, corresponding uh, revenues. Further discussion? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. Sorry. Um, on the resolution for budget amendments for fire overtime cemetery and CBG grant um, sidewalk project, I think we start this round with CARES. Yes. CARES votes yes. HARP? Yes. HARP votes yes. HESS? HESS votes yes. Von Losberg? Von Losberg votes yes. West? West votes yes. Anderson? Yes. Anderson votes yes. And Armstrong? Armstrong votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That is seven ayes and five absent. And the motion is approved. Ms. Hart. I move to adopt a resolution amending the annual appropriations for the city of Missoula, Montana, as set forth in the fiscal year 2018 budget that increases the total city budget budget and expenditures by $49,251 in order to appropriate expenditures to add an administrative assistant number two position to the wastewater slash compost fund. And that motion is in order. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we've had a public hearing. We'll have a roll call vote. On the motion uh, to amend the budget for Garden City uh, Compost, uh, HERP. Yes. Harp votes yes. Hess. Hess votes yes. Bron Von Losberg. Von Losberg votes yes. West. West votes yes. Anderson. Yes. Anderson votes yes. Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. And Cares. Cares votes yes. Does anyone want to change your vote? It's seven ayes and five absent. And the motion's approved. Our next public hearing on the, is on a resolution amending the Missoula Water Division rate schedule to provide for tapping fees on existing water mains. And our staff report this evening comes from Mr. Wilson, Mr. Bowman, Dennis, for the sake of the camera and the audience, I'll have you come to the lectern, please. Good evening. I'm Dennis Bowman, superintendent for Missoula Water. Um, basically, it's a TAP agreement. Uh, basically, well, sorry, a little nervous. You're fine. <laughs> um, adopt a resolution amending the annual appropriation to City of Missoula, Montana, set forth fiscal year 2018 budget increase. Um, well, that's wastewater. There we are. Adopt a resolution of the Missoula City Council amending the rate schedule of the municipal water utility to provide a schedule, schedule fees for new taps on existing main. Basically what this is is that this recovers the cost, the actual cost of the material and labor to do taps on the existing main, which is set for the cost causer. Someone comes in and wants to tap on existing main, we go ahead and they pay the fee. It covers all the costs associated. In the past, it was done um, capitalized by the previous owners and it was spread over the rates for all all customers of the water division so this is basically it's the average cost of recurring the fees associated with doing the taps okay. so so a new user is paying that fee directly correctly okay. thank you okay and with that I will open the public hearing anyone care to comment on this change to our fee schedule Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions from council members? Seeing none, Mr. Hess. Thanks. 
I think this was it, an ANF. Maybe not. It's Sorry. ANF. Ms. Harp, yeah. it's all you all the time? Well, four out of six tonight are coming out of a and <clears throat> So finally, I'd like to adopt a resolution of the Missoula City Council amending the rate schedule of the municipal water utility to provide a schedule of fees for new taps into existing Missoula water system mains for the recovery of labor, equipment, and material costs necessary to complete new taps on existing mains. That motion is in order. Is there discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we've had a public hearing. We'll <coughs> have a roll call vote. Start roll with Hess. Hess votes yes. Von Losberg. Von Losberg votes yes. West. West votes yes. Anderson. Anderson votes yes. Armstrong. Armstrong votes yes. Cares. Cares votes yes. And Harp. Yes. Harp votes yes. Would anybody like to change your vote? That is tw seven ayes and five absent. And that motion is approved as well. Our fifth public hearing this evening is on an ordinance amending the Missoula Municipal Code regarding water service to accessory dwelling units. Mr. Bowman, welcome back. Thank you. Recommendation motion is to adopt the ordinance of the City of Missoula amending the Title 13 municipal, uh, Missoula Municipal Code Chapter 10, 13.30. Point one three zero entitled water service requirements by deleting the provision strictly requiring accessory dwelling units on the same parcel to have a separate water service lines and amending the process for handling subdivision and property services by a single service line. So basically what this does, it used to require the property owner that wants to put an accessory dwelling unit on their property that before it used to, they used to have to do a separate service tap out on the main in the street. What this does is after our city attorney's office looked at it, is that we can accommodate the property owners by letting them just connecting to the existing service line on their property as long as their each dwelling unit has their own shut off and meter pit. That'll basically help the property owners and it actually helps in the future any future maintenance or anything with the street because there's no additional cuts and in, in, um, disturbing the asphalt in the street. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Great. Thank you, sir. With that, I will open the public hearing. Anyone care to comment on this item? Something tells me everyone's holding out for the last one. With that, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions from council members? Ms. Hart. Uh, Mr. Bowman, could you address w w the approximate savings per property owner if they wanted to, um, with using the single tap versus what it used to be? Mr. Bowman? It depends on within the, within the city. Some, uh, some parts of the city in the asphalt, if the customer has to go out into the street, there's asphalt penalties, anywhere from $20 a square foot down to $5 a square foot. Um, on average, it's usually $3,000, $3,500, all the way up to like $10,000 to go into some of the streets. So it's a big savings. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, Mr. Hess. Thank you. Uh, I move we adopt an ordinance of the City of Missoula amending Title 13, Missoula Municipal Code, Chapter 13.30.130, entitled Water Service Requirements by deleting the provision strictly requiring accessory dwellings on the same parcel to have separate water service lines and amending the process for handling subdivision of property serviced by a single service line. I'd like to speak to the motion briefly. Mr. Hess. Um, this is uh, a major benefit of municipal ownership that I think we'll continue to see um, throughout this process or throughout moving forward um, that we have uh, benefits that are not um, directly inside the water system that are that, that cascade down because of um, our ownership of the utility and our ability to set policy. So here we have um, the ability to make an impact in containing uh, the cost of housing, albeit a small impact, but um, but every bit helps in in um, our efforts to reduce the cost of housing. Um, and uh, to, to better manage our streets and, and as, as Dennis mentioned, reduce our number of, of asco asphalt cuts. Um, so it's a small move. It's, it's the uh, first of many, um, and I'm happy to support it. Further discussion? Ms. Anderson. 
I will be um, so voting in support of this, and I want to echo what Council Member Hess said. I want to thank Mr. Bowman and his staff for being so responsive to a lot of these needs and being proactive. And I think that, um, once again, they should be commended for doing a great job in this transition. Ms. West. So there's a lot of uh, zoning districts in Missoula where accessory dwelling units are basically allowed by right, um, and even though it's been made or might be getting easier in other single family zoning districts either uh, as well. I think this infrastructure cost is incredibly prohibitive to people increasing density on their own lots. I know when I looked into potentially adding like an apartment over my garage, the cost of adding a water line alone was $14,000, which is 10% of my construction budget, um, which makes it completely unattainable to a lot of people unless they have a lot of money. So I think this is a great way for us to allow people to be more creative with the spaces they have and increase housing density in Missoula in a way that fits into our neighbor existing neighborhoods. Um, so I'm looking forward to this change. Further discussion? Seeing none, we've had a public hearing. We'll have a roll call vote. On the uh, motion to adopt the ordinance, Von Lossberg. Yes. Von Lossberg votes yes. West. Yes. West votes yes. Anderson. Yes. Anderson votes yes. Armstrong. Yes. Armstrong votes yes. Cares. Yes. Cares votes yes. Harp. Yes. Harp votes yes. And Hess. Yes. Hess votes yes. Would any of you like to change your vote? That's seven eyes and five absent. And the motion is approved. Our final public hearing of the evening is on proposed changes to the Missoula Municipal Smoking Ordinance. And we have a staff report delivered by a triumvirate this evening. <laughs> Mayor, members of the City Council, I'm Ellen Leahy. I'm the health officer at the Missoula City County Health Department. I um, officially refer to you the resolution that the Missoula City County Board of Health passed on January 18th and their recommendations for revising the existing ordinance. Um, to put it into context, this body did adopt the very first smoking ordinance in the state of Montana in 1999. That was some time ago. In 2005, the State Clean Indoor Air Act actually um, up, was upgraded and adopted statutes that are stronger in some areas than your original ordinance. In 2009, the rest of that statute that had a delayed implementation was implemented so that all bars, casinos, and taverns were covered. Um, and then in 2012, the first community to uh, um, change their ordinance so that it include, included e-cigarettes or vaping was actually Helena and Lewis and Clark County. There are currently eight uh, local communities that have broken the trail for us on this go round. So with that, I would thank you for taking it up and thank the, the commenters um, in advance for helping us work on this re regulation, ordinance. Thank you. Ms. Terrio. Hello, my name is Shannon Terrio. I'm the Director of Environmental Health at the City County Health Department. And um, the Health Board adopted a resolution on January 18th, uh, 2018. Um, before adopting the resolution, the Health Board considered how the current ordinance fit with the Montana Clean Indoor Air Act. They looked at the current science, especially when it came to e-cigarettes and vaping. And they looked at the current policies that could benefit um, by being included in the ordinance. So um, this is basically what the Health Board recommended um, for the City Council to revise the ordinance in a way that deleted provisions that are less stringent than state law by being the very first community um, to adopt a smoking ordinance. Um, there were a lot of exceptions that were no longer part of the Montana Clean Indoor Air Act. So right now, the ordinance is actually less stringent than state law. Um, to incorporate the sh uh, smoking shelter requirements, um, smoking shelters, we have a policy at the health department that's helped us since 2010, um, and this would help um, people and know where it is to have it in the municipal code. Um, they also suggested um, including e-cigarettes in the indoor public place smoking prohibitions. Um, 
to prohibit smoking in cert certain outdoor public spaces and that's certain places in our outdoor parks. Um, to provide managers of uh, private businesses the ability to restrict smoking um, cl close to air vents or um, other openings so that customers don't have to walk through smoke and they um, don't have the problem with infiltration of smoke into their businesses. And then to clarify uh, enforcement and penalty procedures. So before we talk about how those we are recommending those be incorporated into the ordinance, um, Kayla will talk about why we need these things, why it's important. Yeah. Hi, so my name is Kayla Warren. I'm with the health department and I do tobacco prevention here in Missoula. Um, kind of just to talk about why change is needed, um, especially focusing on the electronic nicotine delivery devices um, or e-cigarettes. Um, basically, we've done such a good job over the past decade in um, behavior change to make smoking um, less desirable. But now we're noticing this new wave and this new trend of vaping, which is starting to normalize tobacco use and normalize tobacco use behavior here in our community. Um, and what's happening is it's becoming socially acceptable. And because of that, we're seeing that e-cigarette rates are skyrocketing, especially amongst youth, which is really alarming. Um, close to 50% of all high school students in Montana have tried e-cigarettes, and about 23% are current users. So that's kind of scary to think about. Um, and because of that, it's just basically another substance that these kids are being exposed to um, that's hard on a developing brain. And basically, there's a whole new generation that's addicted to this product. Um, and because of that, more people are being exposed to that secondhand vape. Um, and what this would do, and the reason for this change, is to basically reduce that, especially just indoors. Um, basically, e-cigarettes, they still do contain ultrafine particles um, and some chemicals such as nicotine and some metals, and that's according to the CDC. So we're just really trying to help promote public health and reduce the exposure to those chemicals when it comes to indoor exposures. Um, and then finally, the FDA regulations. So e-cigarettes are now deemed a tobacco product and should be monitored as such, so we can have age restrictions and warning labels. Those are huge public health movements. Um, but I also want to recognize that there is this misconception that they are now an approved cessation device. They're not. So many people have um, maybe they've helped them quit or they've helped reduce their smoking habits, but it's not an approved cessation device by the FDA. So I just kind of wanted to recognize that for a quick second. And then, yes. And then when it comes to tobacco-free parks, the other big piece in this is that um, the need for change stemmed even from our uh, Donna Glockler, she approached us with Parks and Rec, saying that they really wanted tobacco-free parks here in Missoula, and we couldn't agree more. One, it promotes healthy lifestyles and models tobacco-free norms, but again, protection against that secondhand smoke exposure. There's no safe level of secondhand smoke exposure. And this really, um, if we think about it, who uses our parks? It's the kids, it's youth, it's families. So we just want to make sure and protect um, the health and safety of our Missoula community. Um, while also um, keeping our lands clean. Cigarette butts are the most commonly discarded piece of waste um, and they are not biodegradable, so that would help with that. And then finally, reducing fire risk. Um, as we all know, it gets long and hot here in the summer, so we want to do any type of prevention we can if this involves um, reducing that risk. So those are kind of the why change is needed now. Um, Shannon Terry again, and now I'm just going to go through the major changes that are recommended in for the ordinance. The first is vaping or e-cigarettes. That was added to the defi definition of smoke and smoking. And then there were also, um, we also added language or proposed language to the purpose section to explain why that was important. Um, secondly, uh, there are expanded smoking prohibitions, so um, the what the, what the changes to the ordinance would do is to make it consistent with uh, the smoking prohibitions for the Montana Clean Indoor Air Act, but it would also include vaping. Um, outdoor, it would codify the park's um, policy to basically um, restrict smoking where a lot of children are gathered. And then it gives the opportunity for business people to restrict smoking within 25 feet of a doorway, as I talked about before. Right now, um, 
the city and the county have that ability, but it is unclear whether um, there, there, there's no authority really for a business downtown to restrict smoking on a sidewalk in a way that would um, help um, would not um, affect their customers. So this would give them that opportunity. With that would come the responsibility of that private business to post signs and to also um, enforce the, or, or um, not enforce, but to um, compel compliance with that um, restriction of smoking. So then it would, as I said before, codify the smoking shelter policy. The Clean Indoor Air Act just is not very specific when it comes to what is, what is and is not a smoking shelter. Um, and so the policy, which really was recently upheld, it wasn't our policy, but what's in our policy was recently upheld by a court case in um, Cascade County. So um, this would just make it very clear about what, how much has to be open in order for it not to be an enclosed public place. Fine, um, when we were in committee, um, Julie Merritt noticed that uh, there are a lot of nots, a lot of negatives in the proposed language. And this is all proposed language. It should all be underlined, but I didn't underline everything so that it could be easier to read. Um, she asked, and um, Councilman Van Losberg asked us to present some um, potential changed language that got rid of some of the knots, some of the negatives. And we worked to do that in um, the, whole, um, the whole rule, but really what we were able to do is take it out of the beginning. Um, Julie Merritt did send an email saying that she thought that that helped clarify and make, make the um, rule more clear. So we would recommend that when the city council uh, adopts the regulation that they include this that you include this change um, to strike the is not an indoor public place a smoking shelter is not an indoor public place when it all right and then finally we did a lot of talking about enforcement there's the opportunity because this is a health um, ordinance that it could be pl applied extraterritorially and um, more than any time in the past, we really talked about what that meant. We talked with the city um, attorney's office and the county attorney's office and um, have, have made it more clear. Um, the indoor violations, the health department would be in charge of enforcement. We would follow the Montana Clean Indoor Air process for um, the warnings and the reprimands before um, turning it over to the city attorneys for fines. Um, Outdoor violations really would fall to the managing entity. So that would fall to the parks department and the parks or the business owners who are restricting smoking within 25 feet of a doorway or other entry into their um, business. And then um, the, the other thing that's important to know is that the police department didn't want people to be under the idea that you could drive down the street, see somebody smoking, and call it in to 911. So there's actually not a penalty for people who are smoking in those outdoor spaces, but if somebody refuses to move along, um, move out of that 25-foot area, um, or they, uh, th there is the possibility that the police could be called by the managing entity to help um, deal with that situation. We don't really expect that to happen. Um, Usually when there are signs that tell people not to smoke, people don't smoke there. So that by far and away is, um, is probably what will happen here. Um, and then I already talked about the extraterritorial application. We did work out that uh, a violation of the ordinance is a violation of municipal code. It would go to municipal court and it would be handled by the city attorney's office. And so we are proposing that the city council, or recommending, sorry, that the city council adopt the revised smoking in public places ordinance after the public hearing with the revised smoking shelter language um, that we proposed. That is it. Thank you very much.
So I will now open the public hearings. There are some faces here I've not seen before, and our process might be a little confusing, so let me describe it for you. Um, this is your opportunity to speak on the ordinance. Um, wh wh what I would ask is that you come to the microphone, identify yourself for the record, and try to keep your comments to around three minutes. I time you, I'm a little bit flexible. Um, to the degree possible, try not to repeat what someone else has said, because council members have heard it. Um, and they are actually listening in my experience. So how many people would like to speak tonight or just by a show of hands? Thank you, I appreciate that. With that, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, hello, Mayor, uh, members of the committee, or City Council, sorry. Could I pass these out to you guys? Or These are packets of... Certainly. My name is Keith Bowman. I'm here to speak on behalf of the Esig Vapor Juice Store, which has four stores in the state of Montana and where I am the general manager and part owner. Vapor products are the first game-changing technology in the ongoing fight to reduce cigarette smoking, which is why we are here. <clears throat> I've given you each packets on numerous studies from physicians, scientists, and institutes of health. I would like to start off with sharing a couple with you about secondhand vapor. <clears throat> Uh, one is from the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health, School of Public Health from Drexel University. It's called the Study Peering Through the Mist. This paper reviews available data on the chemistry of aerosols and liquids of electronic cigarettes and compares modeled exposure of vapors with occupational safety standards. Here are the results and conclusions. There was no evidence of potential exposure of e-cigarette users to contaminants that are associated with risk to health at a level that would warrant attention if we're in an involuntary workplace exposure. Current state of knowledge about chemistry of e-liquids and aerosols associated with electronic cigarettes indicates that there is no evidence that vaping produces inhalable exposures to contaminants of the aerosol that would warrant health concerns by the standards that are used to ensure safety of workplaces. Uh, second one is from the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health. Uh, it's a comparison of the effects of e-cigarette vapor and cigarette smoke on indoor air quality. Uh, the comparisons of pollutant cost concentrations were made between e-cigarette vapor and tobacco smoke samples. Pollutants include volatile organic compounds, carbonyls, PHSs, nicotine, TSNAs, and glycols. From these results, risk analyses were conducted based on a dilution into a 40 square meter room and standard to toxicology data. Non-cancer risk analysis revealed no significant risk of harm to human health for vapor samples from e-liquids A through D. In contrast to tobacco smoke, most findings markedly exceeded risk limits, indicating condition of significant risk of harm to human health. Regarding cancer risk analysis, no vapor samples from e-liquids A through D exceeded the risk limit for either children or adults. The provable physical science shows that time and time again, study after study, that vapor is not the same as your traditional cigarette and should not be treated as such. <clears throat> that was only two of the many extremely qualified studies to prove that fact. That mixed with the ordinance that Missoula has already set in place that states any business that sells vapor, allows vapor in their store shop business must have a completely sealed off building, must have a separate air filtration system slash air source and separate heating and cooling, which we follow. Make sure that our customers are protected. But putting this ordinance on vapor by not allowing vapor to be tested in the vape shops which is a pivotal part of vaping, will make it so we will not be able to properly train our customers, which could possibly lead to unsafe use 
as well as deterring people from trying a healthier alternative to traditional cigarettes. People such as my grandma, <clears throat> who died from emphysema. She never got a chance to try vaping. I loved her so much. Please do not take that chance away from other people's grandmas. Give them the opportunity that my grandma didn't. <clears throat> Exclude vape shops from this ordinance and actually make a difference. I believe in you and I believe you will see the truth and you'll do the right and make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Hello. So I got a few a uh, few studies to pass out if, if that's all right. They're small. They're just little two page little guys. Cool. Thank you, sir. Hello, City Council members. My name is Brandon Gregory, and I'm an employee of eSig Vapor Juice Store in Missoula. I wanted to start off by saying that I'm very passionate about saving absolutely anybody that I possibly can from the number one leading cause of preventable death, according to the CDC, which is smoking. Uh, preventative medicine physician and public health expert, uh, Dr. Michael, Michael Siegel from the School of Public Health at Berkeley has elaborated on a study done by the California Department of Public Health regarding secondhand vapor exposure. In this study, an air quality sample was conducted in an enclosed vape shop while several employees and 13 customers simultaneously used their vapes with no active ventilation system. Uh, the air sample results concluded no evidence of dangerous levels of hazardous pollutants or chemicals, even in one of the most high exposure secondhand vaping situations. Uh, myself, along with almost every vapor that I've met, are respectful about the public's concerns and personal liberties regarding their health and safety in a public setting. We don't vape in bars, restaurants, coffee shops, etc. Um, and in return, I hope that e six shops can continue to be a safe haven, haven sorry, for the current and potential members of the Missoula vaping community to have their questions answered, concerns addressed, equipment professionally serviced, and new flavors tested. Uh, a brighter, longer, and healthier future has been granted to my friends, my family, my loved ones, and myself because of vaping. Uh, myself, along with everybody else, a part of the eSig Vapor Juice Store family, wish to share that vision with our fellow Montanans and as many p people as we possibly can. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. How's it going? Um, I have also got some studies to pass out, unfortunately. So you know what? If you have studies, go ahead and leave them there and we'll okay. pick them up and pass them around. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Right, let me separate them real quick. Sweetness. <clears throat> Hello, members of the City Council. I'm Denzel Neal, and I am also an e eSig Vapor Juice Store employee and also a member of the Missoula Vaping Community and here to oppose this, this city ordinance. Now, everybody's wondering how safe is vaping? So, well, from Public Health England, there are unpin underpinning evidence for the estimate that e-cigarettes use is 95% safer than smoking. The facts to support this claim is the constituents of cigarette smoke it, that harms health to including carcinogens are either absent in e-cigarette vapor or if present they are at levels as much as five below five percent and of smoking does mostly below one percent and far below the safety limits for occupational exposure the main chemicals present present in e-cigarettes only have not been associated with serious risks. There, with other researches done, studies done by Dr. Leon Shahab, which, it, which he published as uh, nicotine carcinogens and toxic exposure 
in long-term e-cigarette and nicotine replacement therapy users by uh, Cancer Research UK. The study group that Dr. Shahab had was e-cigarette users that had been using it for 17 about 17 months around uh, a group of smokers and then a control group of N NRT as their control group to see which was the problem for their safety standards. And smokers with NRT as the control group, reason being NRT has three decades of research into it for safety standards. What Dr. Shahab found was, and I quote from these from his article from the articles, increasingly interestingly, my bad, interestingly, the nicotine levels for e-cigarettes are similar to people who are using NTR nicotine replacement treatments to satisfy their nicotine cravings. In fact, one of the chemicals called NNAL, which is one of the leading causes of lung cancer, is 97% lower in e-cigarette users compared to smokers. Now on the personal note, the, as, working at, as working as an employee at the shops, seeing faces of everyone who has, pro has problems and trying to go into surgery because of smoking, the doctors, they tell me that their doctors recommend vaping and they come in and asking us all these questions about how it's safe and everything. We go through everything book by book and tell them everything that we know. And if not, we look up the answers just to get them better information so that way they can be safe and not harm themselves or others around them. With that being said, after they have their surgeries, they come back in and thank us for all their, all this life changing and how extending their life and showing them the better right way to get off cigarettes and not do anything to harm themselves, really. Thank you all for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, City Council members. Um, I also have some. I'll set them down here for you. Not many trees uh, survived tonight, did they? <laughs> Apparently not. Um, keep it short and sweet for you guys so as not to overlap on anything that's already been said. Um, I have another statement to make on behalf of uh, secondhand vaping. In your name, sir? Uh, Dustin Hadley. Thank Sorry you. about that. Um, so, uh, the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health conducted an assessment on indoor air quality before, during, and after unrestricted use of e-cigarettes in a small room. Um, airborne chemicals in the indoor environment arise from a wide variety of sources, such as uh, burning fuels, such as gasoline, uh, other cigarette use, um, anything from like pollution and other sources. Uh, to understand the contribution of exhaled e-cigarette aerosol to pre-existing chemicals, such as the ones I just listed, uh, in the ambient air, an indoor air quality study was conducted to measure volatile organic compounds, such as nicotine, tobacco-specific nitrosamines, and trace metal levels in the air before, during, and after e-cigarette use in a typical small office meeting room. Uh, measurements were compared with human health criteria values such as indoor air quality guidelines or workplace exposure limits were established to provide a context for potential bystander exposures. In this study, the data suggested that any additional chemicals present due to exhaled e-cigarette aerosol are unlikely to present an air quality issue to bystanders at the levels measured when compared to the regulatory standards that are used for workplaces or general indoor air quality. And then I also wanted to state that personally, I've been vaping for five years and been tobacco free, not nicotine free, but tobacco free. Uh, and that I've never experienced any negative effects or any problems with my lungs in that amount of time. And that, uh, I too have had countless customers in terms of working at the Isaac Vapor Juice Store come in and explain to me that they visit uh, doctors and physicians regularly that have uh, run scans and such on their lungs and are also uh, cardiovascular effects and all of them have come back negative and clear. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Yes, Hello, sir. my name is Cole Basher. I did not plan on speaking today, so I'm going to keep this rather short. Uh, in Europe, countries such as the UK are so sure of the safety of electronic cigarettes that there are government-sponsored ads to help quick, quit smoking with the use of e-cigarettes. Um, whereas in the United States, I have seen lies in the media, I have seen blatant misinformation on government websites and Montana-sponsored TV ads. So I would just like to urge all of you to please read through the information the e-cig vape reduce store has given you and make a more informed choice that includes better flexibility for electronic cigarette users. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else this evening? Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't bring any trees with me, so. All right. My name is Bonnie Hardway. I'm actually new to Missoula. I am actually a consumer. I am not, I don't work for anybody. I am a consumer of vape products. And I have seen coming from Utah, and which is really stringent, we can't try this stuff in stores. A lot of my friends have quit. And I'm in the process of quitting smoking because I've actually been vaping. It's actually been a lot better. I feel a lot healthier. And if we don't have this opportunity to taste or try or learn in the stores, you know, what's going to happen? Yeah, we should keep it from our kids. But you know what? Kids are going to do what they're going to do. We all did the same. We parents tried to keep stuff from us. I'll be honest. My grandparents smoked. I started smoking because of it. They weren't happy about that, but I grew up around it. But my, neither my 18-year-old or my 14-year-old smokes period. They don't even do it. So I think honestly that this indoor policy is just a lot. It's crazy because you know if you're going into the store you know what you're going to come into. Then don't go in there. That's all they're there for. You have no business being there. Don't go in there. It's not affecting anybody else. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sir. <coughs> yeah, my name is Andy Hardison, store manager for Liberty Vapor here in Missoula. I've been with them for about five years now. And just touching on the thing about the uh, kids getting access to vapes. Um, since day one in our store, we've, ident we've asked for identification for anybody that we perceive to be under the age of 18. And since the uh, federal, federal, federal regulations came out, it's now you have, if somebody looks under the age of 26, you have to ID. We've had between five or six different people come, I'll call them narcs for lack of a better term come in and try to, you know, catch us selling to underage children or people, which we never have and we never will. We identify anybody that looks under the age of 18 specifically. And if kids are getting access to vapes, they're not getting from our store, and I know they're not getting from any other stores here in Missoula. Um, just on a personal note for myself, I've been vaping for about six years now, similar to what the gentleman was talking about in relation to health. Feel great, no problems with respiratory or anything like that. And I've seen, the, I've seen that in the vast majority of about 95 plus percent of our customer base that's come through as well in, in a way that's, ways that's helped them and helped their lives improve their, improve their health. Um, what was the other last thing? I think that's everything. Cool, thank, thank you, sir. You. Good evening. My name is Tommy Dobbs and I am one of the owners of Liberty Vapor. Um, just my main concern, I think, with the city ordinance is the fact that you're, it wants to take us as a business and the fact that we can vape and our customers can vape in the store completely away. The city of Missoula is very strict with us as far as giving us leases, the, the different steps that we have to go through in order to have separate ducting. Everything has to be separate from if we're in an attached building, we have to follow certain things. We have to go through certain inspections just to be able to lease a place. Um, so as you heard before, um, also it, with adults coming in there, they're coming into our stores for one thing and one thing only. We don't sell soda, we don't sell chips, we don't sell t-shirts. They know what they're coming into, they know what they're looking for, they know what they're going to get. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? Uh, we don't do a staff bonus round, sorry. <laughs> Well, actually, um, I just wanted to read a letter from Greg Holzman. He is the Montana State Medical Officer with the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. Um, this was sent over today, so I just wanted to share it with you. Um, members of Missoula City Council, as the Montana State Medical Officer and on, on behalf of the Montana Department of Public Health and Human Service, I support the amendment of the Missoula Smoking in Public Places Ordinance to include e-cigarettes in the def definition of smoke 
and smoking or the words to smoke. Desi or designed to protect Montana citizens from the health dangers of secondhand smoke, the 2005 Montana Clean Indoor Air Act prohibits the use of tobacco products in all enclosed public, public places and workplaces, including any indoor area, room, vehicle, or place, or public place that can enter and serve as a place of work. E-cigarettes were not present in this country until two years after the implementation of the Montana Clean Indoor Air Act and have, increasing, and have been increasing in popularity since they've made their way to the United States in 2007. Research on aerosol released by e-cigarettes is alarming and should warrant inclusion of these products in smoke-free laws. Due to the content of e-cigarettes not being regulated, one would not know what is in the aerosol released from an individual product. We do know, however, that e-cigarette aerosol is not, safe, is not as safe as clean air. Studies examined that content of e-cigarette aerosol have revealed that it contains nicotine, metal, ultrafine particles, and cancer-causing chemicals, many of which have been associated with res respiratory conditions, heart disease, and cancer. One study found that the levels of nicotine in e-cigarette aerosol similar to the levels found in cigarette smoke. Exposure to nicotine in any form is unsafe for youth, pregnant women, and developing fetuses. Bystanders are breathing these chemicals involuntarily. Most importantly, workers are not being given a choice between clean, indoor, or between clean air and their job. Furthermore, allowing e-cigarettes to be used in public places normalizes tobacco use and may serve as a gateway to combustible tobacco products and other substances. The U.S. Surgeon General recently reported that e-cigarettes use, use amongst youth is strongly associated with use of other tobacco products. According to, the, to a 2017 study published in Tobacco Control, teens that use e-cigarettes in 12th grade are four times more likely to smoke cigarettes the next year. E-cigarettes pose a danger as well, including fires and explosions. In 2014, the U.S. Fire Administration identified 25 separate e-cigarette fires and explosions dating to 2009 that reported in the media. Allowing these products to be in public places and workplaces puts bystanders at risk. Including e-cigarettes in Missoula's smoking in public places ordinance will protect the public will protect the public's health. Sincerely, Greg Holzman, MD, MPH, Montana State Medical Officer, Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? Candy Matthew Jenkins. I don't know if I'm the oldest person in this room. I think maybe Jim is older than I. But I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, and I used to go every Christmas, Thanksgiving, to my extended family members' homes. In those homes, in those brick homes, without uh, the uh, benefit of the heating and cooling units that we have now and the air cleaning units that we have now. Every fa family member that I knew smoked. In the haze grew that far all of across the rooms. I don't believe a lot of this is necessary because I don't believe a lot of this preaching of against smoking is very truthful. In the 80s, there was a study done on secondhand smoke. I think it was 1,800 people or more. It was uh, uh, immortalized by Rush Limbaugh, who we know likes cigars. But there showed no evidence of secondhand smoke in people that got, uh, in people exposed to it. What we have here is a system of government that wants us to eat the way we're told, flush the way we're told, shower the way we're told, and have habits the way we're told. To me, that's fascistic. And I don't like living in a 
America that's fascistic. So you have made all these laws, all these parameters for no reason at all. You are all scared. You're scared of what you don't know. And then you make up statistics for what you want to be true that's not true. I have six children. All six of my children, boys and girls, are healthy, fairly stable, and I smoke through all my pregnancies. One time, I had to go outside to get a cigarette when all this hysteria stopped, started happening. But I don't believe any of what you're preaching. And the health department is here to defend whatever they want to with whatever statistics they want to. And if you don't read these people's statistics and take action based on the opposing view, like I said, this town has now come to the point where the only view heard is the minority view. And with that, and you're I at four like minutes, that. Ms. Matthew Jenkins. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? Yes, sir. Hey guys, my name is Sanderson Clement. Um, I approve of this ordinance. To be honest, this Your stuff name, hasn't please, been- Your Sanderson Clement. Thank you. This stuff hasn't been around a very long time, and so despite the fact there's been some studies out, I don't think the fact that, yes, it's better than cigarettes really proves that it's good for everybody because well, it just hasn't been around long enough. And I know for myself, I have used this stuff, and being a kind of athletic guy, I notice it kind of affects my own ability to perform in, at my peak level. I felt like it kind of impacted my ability to just my stamina, my ability to absorb oxygen. I know as far as nicotine goes, that kind of impacts the ability for a person to have their uh, <coughs> immune system function as well as it should. So if there is nicotine in these, which there is, and people are breathing that in, it's going to be affecting their immune systems. So I think you guys should do what you're doing and stick with this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else this evening? All right, with that, I will close the public hearing. Are there questions from council members? Ms. West? <laughs> I had a question, um, I guess, relating to state law, possibly. Um, and I was wondering if there was, if we're preempted by state law to exempt vape shops from the indoor air quality um, issues and if we could allow them to sample the products. State law doesn't address it, so you're not preempted in the manner that the health department has presented it. Uh, and when their state law has not addressed it, we're a self-government power with self-government powers. We can attempt to address it ourselves through our local regulations. Ms. Armstrong? Um, and I don't know, I, first of all, I have two questions. Are the vape liquids FDA regulated? Yes or no? And, yes. I, and then I had a question for the business owner that came out that said that it's very difficult to have um, to, to go through all the hoops to open up a vape shop. Is there a, an association or a state list of vape shops that is available? And if you'd like to answer the question, please come to the microphone. I don't believe at this point um, I could get together a list for you if you needed me to, but I don't have one available at this time for the different vape shops. Yeah. Is there any special licensure that is required for a vape shop? Um, the main one is you have to pay $5 each year to the state of Montana to have a tobacco license is how they've 
So you're listed the same as tobacco shops. Yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay, further questions? Mr. Hess. Question probably for the first gentleman that spoke. Um, you mentioned training your customers, equi servicing equipment. Can you, can you elaborate on that, please? What am I elaborating on? Say that again? You mentioned, um, uh, well, you, you mentioned training your customers, and then I believe the gentleman that talked after you mentioned um, servicing equipment. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. So a part, so when someone comes in and they want a new vapor or, and, or if they want a new flavor or something. So say they come in and they haven't, and they've been smoking and they want to try and get off smoking. They come in and they ask us uh, to show them everything, every step of the way on how to use the product. And when they, uh, part of that is trying the liquid. So they have to try the liquid uh, to see if they like it and see if that's uh, part of, I don't know, something that their taste buds like so that that could help them to stop smoking, to get off cigarettes. It's a lot easier to stop smoking and to get off cigarettes when you're doing something that you like. A lot of people use cinnamon, um, different sources of things like that to help them get off cigarettes. Um, but uh, mainly, it's un it would have been unsafe to the whole process when, when uh, we're showing them how to set up their, uh, their equipment. You have to go through in the coils, you have to go through uh, how to run the tank, um, how to run the separate wattage, um, how the batteries work. Um, and a part of that is the tank with the juice in it. And when you fill the tank up that uh, holds the juice, um, if they don't understand how to hit it, um, it, it could uh, not go well. Uh, if they don't understand when to fill it after uh, so long, that could have a dry coil and it would taste really bad. But basically, without properly being able to test would be uh, absolutely uh, detrimental to properly training the customers. Thank yeah. you, sir. Further questions, Mr. Von Losberg. Sir, if you could come back up. Do you have any sort of sense, and I recognize that it's not something that you're gonna have absolute statistics on, but do you have any kind of sense of how many people try this like from a friend or someone else who's doing it before coming into a shop to do it for the first time? Or is coming into a shop the only avenue by which someone, you know, is introduced to this as an option? I mean, you, I mean, you could have a buddy or somebody that has one, but basically, yes. Um, that's how you get to know if it's something that you like. I mean, everybody has friends, and of course, you know, some friends do some things and some friends don't. So you know, maybe they could find out that way, but basically, yes, that is the main way of figuring out if that's something that can help them get off cigarettes. Um, yeah, so, yes. And I have Ms. Kares and Ms. Harp. I had two questions. I think that my first one might be for Kayla. Um, does the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives regulate any of the, any um, vaping? No. Um, the only regulation, like I just said, is through the sale to minors, um, and well, basically through the FDA, that it's recognized as a tobacco product now. So that's how they can regulate it through that, but otherwise, no. Okay, thanks. Yeah. And then, um, I don't mind which, but any of the owners, I'm wondering, you talked about the ducting and you know increased standards that you need to have to in order to be this type of business, and I'm tr trying to understand if that is all because of your regulation as a tobacco shop, um, or if it's a different category that got you there. Do you know how it was that you ended up having to comply with those standards? Because I can't find them. You know, I don't know exactly. Um, when we first opened our shop, this was five and a half years ago, we were in a smaller shop and it was so new even to Missoula back then, we were the first shop here that nobody really cared, there wasn't anything. And then we moved next door two years ago and that's when there was a lot of, um, we had to have two different inspectors come out to check the new space, 
to go up on the roof to make sure that everything was separate from anybody on either side of us. So Thanks for your perspective. I appreciate it. Yeah. Does the health department have any comment on that question? Yeah, Ms. Leahy or Ms. Terrio? No, they're shaking their head. Thank you. Excuse me, so I have a question. Ms. Leahy, can you, or Ms. Terrio, can you tell us, as these folks talk about building code and regulation, where does that live, in statute or in regulation? Um, it's what's being described, I'm not in the building department, but we do work with them on smoking shelters. Um, and what's being described is not anything that we are familiar with. It wouldn't be the health department, okay. I can tell you that. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Karras? Yeah. Ms. Hart? I can confirm. I actually had to sir, move locations nope. two years ago because no, of those sir. standards. No. Ms. Hart? This question is posed to uh, the owners of the shops and potentially their employees. So. I'm the oldest of seven children. Uh, my mother smoked through all of our pregnancies. My father joined her most of the time, and he's now been tobacco-free for probably roughly six months. And he was a chef. And so in the food service industry, it is an absolute chronic problem for anybody in that industry to smoke. And so I asked my father before I came down here today, I said, in your experience, um, you know, what do you, what do you think about it, prohibiting uh, smoking uh, back in the day when we had the smoking ban? And he said, well, believe it or not, back, at, back in the day, cigarette butts would be found in the grocery stores. People would come in the store and just let them fall on the ground and someone else would have to sweep them up. So he was relieved that we went to a whole new level. Um, but, you know, he was a guy who, you know. Take me to a question, please, I know, I know, it's going. My question is, is the, 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 is it truly effective in, ter in terms of really helping people quit smoking? And do people come into your shop, are they still smoking? Or have they truly cut out their smoking habits of tobacco? Yes, they truly have. There is uh, um, almost like 90%, 100% uh, of the customers that come in Every single time they come in, they tell me thank you. Every time they see me, um, I know this uh, this elder gentleman Bob who come in and he fought with me the first time he came into the shop, like fought with me. He's like, "There's no way this is gonna help." I said, "Just try it." I begged him to try it, and he comes in my shop every Wednesday every week. Yes, yes, I wouldn't come up here. I wouldn't be in these meetings every single time. I've been to Helena like five times. And I come up here and give these big speeches and everything, 100%, yes. If I, if I wish I could have given it to my grandma so she could have, they could have helped her, yes. Okay, follow up question then? Ms. Hart? Um, so it is, is the desired outcome, so if we can get people off of tobacco, can we get them off of nicotine? So, so you want your customers not to show up at some point, right? Yes. Okay, how long does that usually take? Depends on the customer. At Six years? At the microphone, <laughs> no, please. No, no, there's no... Some there's, people are still smoking it. Or okay, so at six years. There's no amount of time that you can ask any single person of how long it's going to take them to quit something that they're addicted to. But we hope as least as long, at least amount of time as possible. And yes, our business is, uh, just like any other business, the reoccurring is, is yes, I get it. But yes... Our main goal is for our customers to eventually not come around. Further questions, Ms. Armstrong? So I apologies, I have another question about the liquids, um, if you wouldn't mind coming up. So I'm reading on the FDA website right now, and it looks like that they have a, a regulatory plan in place that should finalize by, 20, by 2022, where they understand how they're gonna regulate these things. Their only compliance right now is in regards to liquids that can contain nicotine, no other liquids. Is it kind of the <clears throat> Wild West when it comes to other liquids? No. So, only, you mean anything without nicotine? Correct. Okay, so no. So every single flavor, whether it be 0 to 24, uh, 0, 3, 6, 12, 18, 24, every single uh, flavor, nicotine level, uh, different mix of flavoring, um, 
Am I leaving anything out? Um, yes, it is all all put uh, all given to the FDA. Every single thing. I mean, uh, we had to hire. Uh, we had to go to the temp service, and it took us three, four months to be able to get everything that the FDA wanted. I mean, they wanted everything. They wanted everything barcoded. Um, nicotine is addictive chemical um, on the side of the bottle. Uh, no, it's not the Wild West anymore. It was in the beginning. But no, no, it is definitely not anymore. It's made it a lot more uh, strenuous and time consuming to do that, but we're absolutely fine to do it. Mr. Von Losberg. One more for you. <laughs> sorry, sir. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> What's your name again? Um, my name's Keith. Keith, sorry. Um, I believe I heard you say you had uh, other uh, stores. I could be wrong about this. I was wondering if you had any uh, shops open in any of the other eight communities. I think I heard eight communities that have ordinance similar to this. Uh, do you or does another owner have? Um, if I did, I'd be probably plan on leaving tomorrow to them. To go and do something similar to this, but I have a sh we have shops in uh, one in Missoula, uh, one in Bozeman, and two in Kalispell. So in Kalispell, not at this moment. Uh, Bozeman, not that I can, not not that I know of, and I probably would know if it was. Um, and at this moment, it's this, and I'll be going to each and every one of them as long as this keeps going. Follow up for, um, are any of those question for the health department? Are any of those communities that have enacted this? So, an ordinance similar to this. Part you want me to say the ones that are. Sure. <coughs> Excuse yes. me. So currently, um, Montana counties with e-cigarette in, um, included in their Clean Indoor Act protocol include Sanders, Granite, Powell, Weibo, Lewis and Clark, Carbon, Yellowstone, Lake, and Lake. Ms. West? Wait, wait, stay, I have a follow-up question. Um, so in those communities, does that apply to just indoor air in general or specific, it also includes vape shops? Yes, they're so all included they're all in equal. indoor, yeah. Okay. Sorry, Sean? Kayla, sorry. sorry. So this ordinance and its enforcement is largely complaint driven, correct? Correct. So hypothetically, if, if we let this stand and no one complained in a vape shop about people smoking in a vape shop, nothing would happen, hypothetically. Hypothetically, yes. It is complaint driven, similar to the State Clean Indoor Air Act. It wouldn't be any different. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kears? Uh, my question is for the health department, maybe Ms. Terrio, I'm not sure. Julie Armstrong had asked, uh, I'm not sure the exact phrasing of her question, but something along the lines of, have you thought about a vape shop exemption? And the response that we received was that um, if vape shops were to be exempted, exempted, which the health department does not support, it would be difficult to define what is and isn't a vape shop in a way that would be fair to all retailers. And I just wanted uh, someone from the health department to expand on that a little bit. I have some assumptions, but I, you know about those they could be wrong so I'd like to hear like what other sorts of retailer retailers might be lumped into this or what the concerns might be okay I'll start um, so one of our one of our concerns is that um, it is how you would define it. So there are definitely more shops than just vape shops that sell vape products. And so you would have to decide at what point are you, um, are you selling enough vape products to no longer uh, protect your customers or your employees from secondhand vape, basically. Um, when you think about the Montana Clean Indoor Air Act, they don't um, accept um, or exempt tobacco shops and we see this essentially the same way it's like there's not a reason to exempt vape shops either um, there are there is the potential already in the proposed ordinance to allow um, uh, any business to create a um, smoking shelter 
And so um, that the, the idea of a smoking shelter is that it's open enough so that there's enough ventilation and that it won't create the hazardous um, clean indoor air space. But to answer your question specifically about what other places sell vape products, I think Kayla would be a better person to answer that. Yes, so vape shops obviously primarily sell them, but they can also be purchased in, in grocery stores, convenience stores, gas stations. So um, working with an exemption like that would be difficult considering the numerous amounts of other businesses that also sell e, like e-liquids and vapes. So. And one of the things that we found with the uh, Montana Clean Indoor Air Act is that really businesses want a, an even playing field. They want it to be um, kind of all or nothing. And when the, in 2009, when the <coughs> restrictions went in for smoking in bars and uh, taverns, there was a general sense of relief for bar and tavern owners because they no longer had to make that decision about whether they were going to protect their customers and their employees or um, allow smoking. So we see it as the, we're looking at it the same way. Uh, Ms. West, Ms. Armstrong. Shannon, sorry. Is there a general perception amongst business owners that if someone walks by their establishment and sees smoke inside that they believe it's it's burned tobacco smoke do you think i do not if, know if it's vape smoke right i don't i don't know but what what i can tell you is that um secondhand smoke is is dangerous and does affect people and that um secondhand vape contains chemicals that can be inhaled by people that are bystanders and that there are studies that have shown that the secondhand vape is um, does when when people are vaping there are increased levels of particulate and increased levels of nicotine so it is true that sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a vapor and um, a cigarette but um, both of them have public health concerns so Okay, Ms. West and then Ms. Cares. So I, I guess I have a question on maybe the definition of clean indoor air, because um, a lot of times indoor air is dirtier than outdoor air. Um, and so I was wondering with vaping and the chemicals that are present in secondhand vaping smoke versus chemicals that are already present in our environment. Um, I'm thinking of like, off-gassing from carpets and paint and um, vinyls and all these things that I'm I'm worried about in my own life. Um, I, I, I'm curious if there's any research out there how or if you know what the numbers are of how secondhand vaping affects or, or is set out from that background pollution that already exists in our indoor air, I guess, does that make sense? Uh, Kayla may be better to answer this, but there are studies that show in environments where vaping is occurring that there are increased levels of particulate and nicotine, um, and both of those are concerns. Um, a lot of times, if you look at um, contaminants in our environment, they're additive, and so um, we're looking at ways to increase that exposure load. And one of the ways is to not allow smoking of cigarettes or cigars, and another way is to um, reduce the amount of vaping that goes on in indoor public places. Ms. Kears. I was going to follow up. Too. Is that okay? There's a follow up. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want me to answer that one? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I just came across this, though. So when multiple people using e-cigarettes indoors at the same time, the air quality decreases significantly. Levels of um, particular matter found when multiple individuals were smoking e-cigarettes was comparable to a very smoky bar or casino. Um, this level significantly exceeds the U.S. EPA um, annual standards. Ms. Kears. Um, Many of our questions for the vape shop owners are anecdotal, but just carry on with that. Um, do you do anything around employee awareness and like, if you take this job, you will be around vape smoke, which may or may not be dangerous because a ton of documents will tell you super opposite things. Um, do you? Absolutely. So every time 
you hire an employee, your number one objective from the employee is to protect the employee and then obviously protect the business. So yes, they have to sign something saying that uh, there could possibly, you know, there's the reason why everybody's, it sounds kind of confused, confused, is that we only talk about things that are facts. And yes, there are, there's 10, there's 10 in your folder right there. There's all different sorts of things that uh, are out there that show that there's not necessarily a, a line that we're going to put down for the employee saying, hey, it's not smoking. It's not the same thing. They, they are not one in the same. They're different. And there's about 50 studies, million studies out there to prove that I'm, what I'm saying is right. And I'd like to see the other studies that are, that are saying that I'm wrong. That's why we don't, we don't really have to do that so much for the customer. I mean, for the employees. Okay. Further questions? You, you all want to get this done tonight? Is that a yes? Ms. Cares. Okay. As the Chair of Public Safety and Health, I'll read the recommended motion, which is to adopt an ordinance amending Chapter 8.37, Missoula Municipal Code, entitled Smoking in Indoor Places of Employment and Public Places, revising the title to read Smoking in Public Places, and amending sections 8.37.010 through 8.37.140 to update regulations and address e-cigarettes, codify Health Department smoking shelter guidelines, and parks and recreation rules restricting smoking in certain areas, afford private businesses the ability to strict smoking within 25 feet of their doorways, vents, and other openings, and clarify enforcement procedures. That motion is in order. Is there a discussion on the motion? Ms. Armstrong. So I think you all saw the letter circulated from the American Heart Association that they were in support of the changes in this ordinance, um, which I sent last week. If you didn't get that, let me know. Um, so I'm on the health board, and we had two interesting points of view that were that were given to us. We have a, um, a person who's a chemist and was actually one of the first importers of e-cigarette devices into this country when it happened. And he told us um, how sketchy those devices were and how, because of his chemistry background, that the burning of the different liquids led to all sorts of, of issues because they were in their infancy. and. I know they have evolved greatly. I know that the, the burning devices, the, the propylene glycol base, I know it's all evolved significantly, but even knowing all that with his background in chemistry, he still was not sure that saying this is okay to burn in a public, a public space. On the other side of it, strangely enough, the doctor on our board said, look, if I have to pick between a patient of mine smoking burnt tobacco or smoking vape, I'm gonna pick vape. He said just from a health perspective, I think that's safer. That being said, my concern is I believe the vape shops are regulated. I think you, you have the liquids dialed in. I think you have the devices dialed in. You are a very small percentage of what's on the street. People are getting things off eBay. They're getting things off of uh, uh, all over the place, and those things are the Wild West. <laughs> so the, those liquids and those devices are are the X factor. Those are the ones that I'm concerned about being in the public space. I'm concerned about these things exploding. I'm concerned about the heavy metals being um, vaped out with the vapor with those devices. Like I said, hypothetically, this is complaint driven. I personally don't have a problem with people vaping inside vape shops. I know the health board is going to kill me for saying that. But I do not want people vaping in public spaces. I'm going to tell you that. And I don't want my, the businesses to have to worry about seeing vapor and saying, oh, people are smoking in this space. I'm not going to, I'm, I don't want to be a patron of this place. So I'm going to vote in support of the ordinance. And I'm going to ask for an amendment. So I would like to amend the last section um, of the effective date. I would like to give these businesses and patrons some time uh, to not be effective for six months instead of 30 days. And that's in the enforcement clause of 8.37.080. So instead of being 30 days effective from the state, six months. 
Ms. Armstrong has offered a motion to amend. Discussion on that motion, Ms. Kares? Uh, I was going to accept it as a friendly emo motion, but I'm would not sure the rest of council. I would like to hear the rest of council, I guess. I'm not ready to accept it. Sorry, Mayor. Okay. Discussion on the motion to amend. Changing the effective date. Ms. Anderson. I am in support of the motion to amend. I think that um, giving them six months to comply and get both smoking shelters in place um, is something that we can accommodate. Any further discussion on the motion to amend, Ms. West? So I guess my question was what the goal was of the amendment, whether it is that people install smoking shelters or that we further look at the policy in that six months. Um, I don't feel comfortable just supporting it without knowing what that six month um, extension is for. So. Ms. Armstrong? The FDA currently has a regulation plan in place that is evolving constantly and it's not to be finalized until 2022. Um, I think that I'm hoping that at some point the state will have a formal process to separate vape shops out from tobacco shops. Right now they're all lumped into one category. And there's no way, as, as Ms. Leahy said, there's no way to know what's a vape shop and what's not, or what's a certified vape shop. And uh, I think there's a lot more regulation that needs to be discerned. Um, and plus it's an education. I mean, you're, this is their main business and you're affecting, you're affecting that. That being said, I still absolutely support all the other changes in this, this ordinance, and I believe people should not be able to vape in public places. Mr. Von Lossberg, on the motion to amend? I support the motion to amend. We've done this in, in other cases with other ordinances, um, and I believe in an email that the health department um, expressed support for this if it was considered. So I'm comfortable with the amendment and plan to support it. Further discussion? Seeing none, anyone in the audience want to comment on the motion to amend? Seeing none, we'll have a voice. Sir? Okay. okay. With that, we'll have a voice vote on the motion to amend. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We're back to the main motion as amended. Further discussion? Mr. Ron Osberg? I had a question for Ms. Kares if the main motion includes the recommended change in the early part of the ordinance, removing the multiple knots? I, it didn't. I thought that it was coming from um, committee, and so it still needs to be brought. Or do you want me to say, I've brought in it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Von Lossberg. So I'd, I'd move to amend um, to make the language change that Ms. Terrio uh, described at the beginning of her presentation uh, with the couple sentences toward the beginning. Um, do you need me to be more specific? Well, I bet Ms. Kares would accept that as a friendly amendment. Indeed, regarding the smoking shelter knots to increase clarity, I accept as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion on the motion as amended? Ms. Kares? Um, similar to Ms. Armstrong, I strongly support many pieces of this ordinance. I think it's great that we are allowing private entities um, more control over their domain, and I think it's great that we are eliminating the ability to rightfully smoke on um, public parks areas, and um, I think it's good generally that we're including vaping in the definition of smoking in terms of the things that I've mentioned. Um, but this vape shop thing, I, I don't think is great. And um, I don't think that there is an amendment that is coming. Um, and I, I've been in discussion with my stepsister today about her use of vapor um, e-cigarettes. And I said, you know, what if you couldn't try it anywhere because of Sydney ordinance? And her response was that she would start smoking regular cigarettes or go to Idaho, she lives in Spokane, or um, to buy it. Um, and I was like, you really have to try it? And she says, yes, everyone tries it. Um, and you know, it's just not a world that I live in, but I respect her and I want her to not smoke cigarettes. And um, because of these reasons in our discussion today, I won't be supporting the the ordinance. Okay, further discussion? Ms. Anderson? Um, 
thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, I will be supporting this ordinance um, because I think that the science is still not firm on this. There was a point in time where they told you to smoke cigarettes to help with pneumonia and various other th uh, ailments. And we used to put cocaine in Coca-Cola and bloodletting used to be a thing. So I think that the science on this is still evolving and I think that the FDA and the CDC do not feel as though it is safe. And I have to look to those experts and um, I also am concerned that I understand that it is, when you compare it to smoking cigarettes, it's better, yes, but it is not proven to be a satiation tool. And I also have a grandmother who smoked for years and years who took up vaping and then went back to smoking cigarettes. And I have other grandparents who died because of smoking cigarettes. And I don't necessarily know if them vaping would have solved the problem. So <coughs> I think that um, this is seems to be a prudent step and I will be supporting the ordinance. Further discussion? Mr. Von Losberg? Thanks. I'll be supporting the ordinance as well. Um, as Ms. Armstrong mentioned, there's, um, and others mentioned, um, Ms. Cares, there's a number of um, really good aspects to the ordinance that are important relative to getting up to current times with the Clean Indoor Air Act and um, what we do in parks and codifying codifying policy there, um, providing business owners along uh, sidewalk dining venues um, a better mechanism to um, really meet their needs and their customer needs. Um, certainly the vast majority, all, all the conversation has been focused um, around the vape shops and I'm not unsympathetic to the concerns there. Uh, at the end of the day, um, narrowly, I, I believe there's still an opportunity uh, for those shops to operate in a way um, I realize and I appreciate that there is a, a real impact, um, but the aspects of um, some of the, the places where um, the equipment's being sold and such that are not solely the shops um, makes it um, more difficult for me uh, to, to not support it. Um, and I think with the delayed implementation and the opportunity for the shelters, there's still an avenue there for people um, uh, to try it and, and be taught the things that they need to be taught. Um, but I'm not, as I said, I appreciate the people's comments on this and I, uh, that part is difficult, um, but I am gonna support the ordinance. Further discussion? Ms. West. Um, so I guess, <laughs> I agree with like 98 percent of this ordinance. Um, I, I think a lot of times we legislate um, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, to maybe incentivize certain behaviors. Um, and a large part of this is modeling behaviors in public spaces. And I agree with those. Like I think we should be not smoking in parks and it doesn't matter what kind of smoking it is and I have this discussion with my husband all the time who thankfully gave up smoking but now vapes as is my mom and all of my siblings um, I'm the only non-smoker in the family uh, so I, I really struggle with the vape shop piece of this um, I think it's not enough to vote against it but I'm hoping with the six-month delay maybe um, since this is an area that's a complete gray zone as far as state law goes and we are an entitlement city that maybe there's some way we can still come up with a better solution um, and I I guess I would disagree that vape shops are so ill-defined um, just because I would never consider a grocery store or a gas station a vape shop um, and I'm hoping that maybe they're can be some better resolution than making everybody retrofit their spaces again. So yes. I don't, I'll support it, but hopefully but reluctantly. Mr. Hess? Thanks. Um, I'm caught somewhere in between several of my colleagues, I guess. I, I appreciate the way that uh, Ms. West articulated that just now. Um, there are undeniably a number of, of very positive aspects in this, um, in this ordinance. Um, I regardless of the validity. I mean, I think there's probably some questionable uh, science throughout this process that, that needs to be um, uh, examined more carefully. Um, but um, 
there, there's, and I know that the vape, that, that vaping is not an approved cessation device, um, but anecdotally it appears to have worked for, for some people and, and that's, um, um, that's worth noting. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to articulate my, um, my, frust or my, 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 my concern here, I guess. Um, on balance, there's a lot of great stuff in here. Um, and, I, and I'm very supportive of, of um, uh, eliminating, reducing uh, uh, tobacco use in public, including, including vaping. Um, and um, I'm a little um, reluctant to, um, to um, wade into um, regulating the very narrow type of business that has been presented here, which is, um, which is um, uh, as Ms. West mentioned, is um, uh, very different to me than a grocery store or a gas station or, or another type of establishment. Um, but it appears that legally, I mean, you get a $5 tobacco license, which is crazy that it's $5, but, um, but it's, you know, that, that appears to be the legal um, uh, category that, that that everything's lumped into here. Um, so I, I, I'm going to support the, the, the ordinance. I think there's a lot of great stuff. Um, and as the, as the field evolves, um, I encourage a, a, a greater dialogue. Ms. Hart. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question of the health department? Um, is there a, a restriction in terms of allowing the vape shops to be able to operate uh, or be able to have vaping within their within their buildings. Is there a state uh, ruling? I'm sorry. No. Is there a state ruling that prevents them from being able to use it? The Clean Indoor Air Act does not address vaping. So there is no state prohibition okay. um, for vaping anywhere in any public space. Okay. Thank you. I just needed the clarification. Further discussion? Ms. Armstrong? Ms. Leahy, I know this is this is probably counterproductive. Would there be any opportunity, and I know it would probably be labor intensive, to survey vape shops and have them register somewhat and, and have a list of those and exempt those? Is there any opportunity or is that just going backwards? Um, I can't say there's no opportunity to do that. I think you have several here. I don't know, though, that that method would um, mitigate, let alone abate, the issues of the even playing field and what is a, what is a vape shop. So that, that's something that we've run into, you know, currently with are people smoking in the building? Is it a separate business? Is it a separate building? Um, so that's, that's the mire we don't want to march into. Do we run into a legal quandary against the Clean Air Act by us exempting them? Does that put us in counter? Like if somebody wants to go in and use the restroom and there's, we've allowed people to smoke in there. The Clean Air Act does not address vaping in any way, as I believe Mr. Nugent spoke to that earlier. Yeah, so this is a local ordinance. You, local. you may define what a vape shop is. Council has that prerogative. You can define it an ordinance you can allow I mean you, you can do what you want here but the ordinance before you does not do that okay. further discussion Ms. Hart? I'd like to make an amendment that we define the what a vape shop is to be uh, solely vape vaping equipment and product so that is a complicated piece of regulation that you're not going to get done tonight? I figured as much. I'm, I'm not saying you can't offer that amendment, but you're going you're gonna to need, need to give staff plenty of lead time to try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would also probably have some encouragement that from the owners, too, for sort of participation in that discussion. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Ron Losberg. So, Mr. Mayor, if you could advise me procedurally at this point, uh, if we wanted to return it to committee, would, uh, is there an opportunity to do that with the motion on the floor? 
you 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 ne nearly need, need to tell me that you want to return it to committee and we'll vote on that i would like to return this to committee okay mr ron losberg has asked that this item be returned to committee uh, we can do that a couple of ways i'm going to ask without objection see how that goes any objection to returning the item to committee all right with that the item is returned to committee for further consideration thank you all for your attendance and efforts this evening uh we don't have any more public hearings ladies and gentlemen we do have a few other items of business so if you all can uh if you're exiting if you're exiting the room if you could do so quietly because we're still in session i would be grateful i will pass on communications from the mayor we'll begin general comments from council members this evening with ms cares <laughs> ms anderson ms armstrong Ms. Harp, Mr. Hess, Ms. West, Mr. Von Losberg. With that, we have, unless I've been fooled, no committee reports. We have no, no items of new business. Are there any additional items to be referred? Ms. Cares? Sorry, I um, should have a committee report for Rule 4.112. Uh, public Safety and Health. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't make sure it was in here. Rule 4112, I believe, was on the consent agenda. I sent oh. out an email stating that. Totally on top of it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, we, do we have any uh, miscellaneous communications, reports, petitions, or announcements? Seeing none of those, as always, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your service. We will be adjourned. <laughs>